Dr. David. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to present this information. I'm actually really excited about presenting this. Um, you know, there's lots of talk right now about vitamin D3, and um, Dr. David has had Elizabeth Owings, Dr. Elizabeth Owings, who I highly admire, um, doing a presentation that will be available. And um, also Dr. Dougal um, was uh, doing a presentation two weeks ago. His was excellent. And so, you know, who am I, I think, uh, to, <laughs> to be doing a presentation here. But I do know, because I'm not a medical professional, that sometimes the way I articulate things is a little bit easier to understand. But let's recognize there is going to be lots of talk in the coming days and in the immediate future about uh, vitamin D and you know all the things that it's going to be doing. I want to, at the onset, um, give some credits. Certainly, Dr. Dougal's presentation was very excellent. Um, I want to thank Dr. Robert Haney. Uh, who's a medical professional and a respected D3 researcher. His work has been outstanding. I will be um, alluding to some of his work. Dr. John, John Cannell of the Vitamin D Research Council and the Grassroots Health um, Organization. All of these, uh, these last three are doing, well, including Dr. Dougal, they're doing excellent research on vitamin D3. And so I've um, incorporated some of their quotes throughout this presentation. You know, there's always going to be naysayers about the value of vitamin D3 in health. And I want to just share a story. I, I once um, was having lunch with a physician who had inspired me to um, talk about health and nutrition. And she said to me, Jackie, I think you, you need to find out a little bit about progesterone. And I said, oh, no, no, Barbara, that's a, a hormone. You know, if you're talking about another hormone, it's probably going to be like um, overdosing with estrogen, and it's just going to cause women no end of problem. <laughs> Things couldn't have been further from the truth. As I began to delve into and research for myself um, what progesterone does in the body and connected then with Dr. John Lee, all of it made sense, but up until that point, I was one of the naysayers. So I would say this about people who, who don't give credibility to the research that's being done on vitamin D3. Number one, um, they will not have been doing the research themselves. They will not have been uh, a part of uh, finding out the research that is behind this, because there is tons. At the end of this presentation, there are three pages <laughs> of research documents. And I could have listed many, many more that were referenced in this uh, presentation. With all that being said, I hope to present a case for improving your D3 stores in your body and for testing regularly. And if we accomplish that and achieve that, I would be delighted. So without, without saying anything more, we're going to move ahead here with our slides. I'm, I'm, my plan is to cover all of this information. We're going to talk just a little bit. I just want to touch on the history of D3. We want to talk about some facts, and they may be facts that you know, perhaps you don't know. Disease and conditions, I couldn't possibly cover them all. It's not possible because there are more diseases and conditions that are uh, coming to the forefront as being affected by vitamin D almost on a daily basis. I do want to answer some of the whys. Why are we deficient? Um, why are the sources of vitamin D not readily available? How come we haven't been able to maintain our vitamin D stores? Who's at risk for vitamin D deficiency? And then really, how much do we need? I want to talk about testing because I think that um, testing becomes an important issue. I want to talk about supplementation and then we'll uh, leave you with some resource pages. <laughs> so let's just very briefly, I want to go into the history. I don't want anybody's eyes to glaze over at this. Let's just touch on a few points. First of all, I put 1865 in there because vitamin D has been recognized for a long time, just in case you think it's something that's relatively new. They recognized in 1936 that vitamin D was found in cod liver oil. Now, interesting to note, cod liver oil is the second product that has the most cholesterol in it. Tuck that information away for a little bit. In 1937, they obtained crystallized vitamin D3 by activating a, a, a form of vitamin or a form of cholesterol, 
these are significant points. All through the 1980s, vitamin D was researched and for, you know, they found receptor sites, they found a mechanism with which D3 worked. Then in the late 1990s and into the early uh, 2000s, then the research started to come to the forefront. Well, first of all, in 1997, Food and Drug decided that they were going to put an intake level um, and cap it. And <laughs> they managed to do that, but they didn't really base it on any particular uh, research or study, which is unfortunate. And so they capped it at a very low level. In 2003, and from there on and to the present day, lots and lots of research. And I just noted a couple here for you, but there's ongoingly research, and I've incorporated that into my presentation a 30% lower risk of hip fracture for those who are just consuming 600 IUs of vitamin D a day uh, supplementally, adding on, 17% uh, reduction in all cancer incidences, and 29% uh, reduction in total cancer mortality. These kinds of studies are coming fast and furious. So let's talk about vitamin D. What about it? Well, first of all, it's a fat-soluble, what we would call a pro-hormone. It's a pro-hormone as when it's being made on your skin, it becomes a hormone once it is um, converted in the liver. It's stored in body fat. Mm, that could be problems for people with obesity, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. Do you know that cholesterol must be present in adequate amounts to produce vitamin D3? Um, again, because D3 is now being classified as a hormone, those of you who have listened to my hormone presentation should not be surprised. All steroid hormones are manufactured from cholesterol. Why would it be any different with vitamin D3? That poses some interesting points about cholesterol, and we'll come to those a little bit later as well. Vitamin D itself is not biologically active, particularly when it's produced on your skin. Um, it becomes active uh, after it hits the liver, basically. It's metabolized in the diet or it's synthesized in the skin. So the active forms are uh, converted in the liver. The question then of hormone or vitamin. Well, hormone is a chemical messenger. It's a substance that's produced in the body that controls and regulates certain activities in cells. It's actually uh, a messenger that sends a, a good strong message to a cell to do something. Well, a vitamin is a compound that usually we obtain outside of our body, has to go through the digestive tract. Um, and is just a required nutrient. This is the main reason why vitamin D3 is now considered a hormone because it is, um, it is produced by the liver uh, from the pro-hormone D3. It's produced by the liver and it has much cellular activity. There are a number of forms of vitamin D3 um, and you, you may or may not be aware of these. I come in contact with two of these forms. One is D3 and the, which is produced on our, you know, from our skin. The other one is D2, which is at the bottom of this slide. Um, and, and again, from D3 is converted in the liver to um, calcidol, uh, calcididol, which is um, then converted in the kidneys to calcitrol. Now, um, calcitrol is, is um, the main um, vitamin that people have, or researchers have looked at because it helps to metabolize uh, calcium. And so they really kind of stopped at that, at, at that level, but we now know that it has many, many, many more functions and we'll get into that as well. Now, ergos calciferol is vitamin D2. I was able to visit with my mother's physician, and my mom is 50, um, pardon me, 92. Um, and I asked him if at 92 she was on some form of vitamin D. And he said, oh, absolutely. I said, is she on D3? Because D3, we know, is the, the form that is readily available to the body. He said, I'm sure that she is. Well, when we looked at the prescription, and that's the key word that, that the physician gave her, it was in fact D2, which was a synthetic form of vitamin D that she was on. Her um, kidney specialist told her that she was not uh, obtaining adequate amounts of uh, vitamin D from the supplement that, that she was on, and now I know why, because D2 doesn't provide enough. Let's look at how this vitamin 
works in our body. First of all, if you'll notice, I'll get my cursor out here, uh, the sun shines on our skin, produces vitamin D in our skin. That vitamin D could also, at that introduction, if you weren't sitting in the sun, could come from food that you were eating in your diet, it could come from fish that you were eating in your diet. Nevertheless, all of it goes into the liver, and the liver then changes it. What we thought originally is that the kidneys took it and helped uh, metabolize calcium, and that's where kind of most everything stopped at that point. Well, what we now know is from the liver, it goes into help many other areas. It, it regulates cell growth, apoptosis, or cell death as well. It regulates immune function, blood pressure, insulin, heart disease, on and on it goes. So taking it past the kidney um, and, and beyond just bone health, I think, becomes very important for us. So what are the main functions of vitamin D3? Well, certainly regulation of calcium and phosphate um, is, in our blood is really important. And that then constitutes remineralization of bone on a continuous basis. Our bones remodel on an ongoing basis, and so this is an activity that requires vitamin D. And we need to understand that that's an important issue. However, we need to also understand that it, you know, vitamin D does more than that. It controls cell proliferation and differentiation. So it's going to have a context in a lot of other diseases. It modulates the immune system. It's going to have a context in a lot of other diseases. I think that the, the main thing that we can say is that when we look at the, and let's look back at this picture of how vitamin D is produced in our body. Number one, we want to make sure that we have an adequate amount of calcium, uh, of um, cholesterol in our body so that the vitamin D can convert uh, in our skin. We know that it is solar ultraviolet B radiation that causes this to happen. It's not all sun rays, it's basically ultraviolet B that happens. Um, when it connects with our skin, um, it produces vitamin D if we have enough uh, cholesterol in our body. In, in addition to cholesterol, our body requires some cofactors to um, utilize vitamin D properly. So we need to actually have a fairly good diet. If not, we need to be taking dietary supplements that, that give us. But what we normally teach at Helpful Hormones is that we need to have a diet that's high in vitamins and minerals. And so making sure that we eat an adequate amount of vegetables an adequate amount of good fruit that are all fresh would be very important. Zinc, vitamin K, boron, a tiny amount of vitamin A, and magnesium um, are very, very, very necessary as cofactors to vitamin D. So if you're not ab absorbing your vitamin D, say you're taking a supplement, you're listening to us, and you've done a test, and your vitamin D stores didn't come up enough, there's every possibility that, for instance, magnesium could be low. You want to make sure that you're not deficient in magnesium. There is a major difference between vitamin D2 and vitamin D3, and I want to give credit to Dr. Robert Heaney right here, because he did these awesome slides and, um, and showing that difference. But I want you to know that other organizations, for instance, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition has supported the fact that vitamin D2 is a synthetic form of vitamin D, and should not be regarded as a nutrient suitable for supplementation or fortification. So for a long time, for instance, milk was fortified with vitamin D2. I believe in most states and provinces that has been changed. But you need to be aware of what form of vitamin you're getting, and that might be the reason why your vitamin D stores are low if you are supplementing. Vitamin D2 versus vitamin D3, and I found this very interesting. So these people were given a dose, a single dose, 50,000 I use. Most of you on the, on the call tonight won't take that much in one dose. Um, there were 10 people selected in each group for this, and look at this. I'll bring my cursor up. The vitamin D2 group, the, the bottom dropped out of it within a very short period of time, taking that high a dose. The people that were on D3, it stayed in the body much longer. 
And we know that to be true of sunshine, vitamin D. It stays in the body longer than a supplement would even. So think of the benefit of being in the sunshine versus even these high doses. Now, the quantity of vitamin D that was um, entertained by the body, absorbed if you would, was amazing as well. So out of the 50,000 units that were given, uh, very little was absorbed of D2, a lot more of D3. And so I, I believe that the, the situation of D2 versus D3 is a non-situation. We should not be t taking prescription vitamin D. Prescription vitamin D is almost universally vitamin D2. Over-the-counter D3 is, is superior. <laughs> Now, let's talk about disease. Vitamin D uh, is 75% of North Americans are deficient. And there are low levels um, that might even increase, increase disease. And that is what is being said in most endocrinology. Um, and that's why I'm talking about this tonight as a hormone relationship, because endocrinology is the field where hormones are found. So if 75% of North Americans are deficient in vitamin D, what is the ramification of that hormonally or even health-wise? Dr. Heaney says that there are more than 30 randomized control trials going on presently with vitamin D. And I believe that that's, that's actually even compounding as we speak. More and more universities and colleges are studying vitamin D. So if you come across a naysayer, somebody who says, oh, that vitamin D thing, I don't believe it. They're not doing their research. There's so much research out there that um, it would be very difficult to not believe this. What's happening worldwide? Well, according to the Mayo Clinic, there's an estimated 1 mil billion people. I mean, I can't imagine how many people that is that have a vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency. Um, 40 to 100 percent of U.S. and Europeans um, in the elderly category, still living in the community now, not in nursing homes, are deficient in vitamin D. Um, and more than 50% of postmenopausal women taking drugs for osteoporosis have suboptimal levels, or levels below 30 nanograms per mole of vitamin D. And that tells us a lot. You know, I, I state in live seminars that for menopausal women, one of our biggest challenges is going to be osteoporosis. Um, there's no question that vitamin D is going to play a role in that, and most of us don't have an adequate amount of vitamin D to help us absorb all the calcium supplementation that we're taking. We'll talk about that a little later as well. So what are some of the diseases? Of course, bone diseases are going to come to the forefront. Um, there's no question, for instance, with, with uh, rickets. Um, that was the first disease that uh, was associated directly with a lack of sunlight. And that happened in the early 1800s, in the 19th century. Now, it was immediately associated with vitamin D deficiency. And guess what everybody got in the 1900s? Most of us got cod liver oil. I was born in 1947. And I can remember um, the Watkins dealer came to the door. And <laughs> we were given an orange uh, elixir of cod liver oil. And why cod liver oil? Because it was considered to be uh, high in vitamin D and would help us to absorb calcium and so that most of us would not get rickets. Well, guess what's happening? Um, and this is just one note that I have, but other doctors have been saying that this is universal right across North America, but breastfed African American babies in North Carolina are still getting rickets. They're not the only ones. Rickets is becoming a problem across the United States. Now, amazingly enough, um, if all it takes is a little bit of sunshine or a supplement of vitamin D, which is really inexpensive, um, this should not be happening. Well, what other bone diseases are happening out there? Um, there's no question about it that um, there's an, uh, an adult version, osteomalacia, uh, a bone version of rickets that's happening amongst elderly, and we'll tend to see it amongst elderly. If you think in terms of cholesterol being the main building block for vitamin D, as men and women age, they're being put on cholesterol-lowering medication. So the potential for producing vitamin D3 is diminished dramatically. 
Vitamin D plays the role in calcium absorption and metabolism. So if we're not producing it, we're not going to be having strong, healthy bones. Low values of vitamin D increase parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone pulls calcium from the bones. Thus, if we don't restore our vitamin D stores to uh, the proper level, our, our bone development won't matter how many hormones we take, we're not going to restore bone density. It won't matter how much calcium we take, we're not going to restore bone density. It won't matter how much estrogen a woman takes, they're not going to restore bone density until they get out in the sun and uh, get their body producing some vitamin D. It increases calcium and phosphorus absorption in the gut. It, and so when you take vitamin D, you're going to get more calcium into your body from the supplements you're using or from the food that you're con consuming. Uh, osteoclasts are the um, organism that breaks down old bone within the bone matrix. And when you have, uh, you want a certain amount of osteoclast activity so that there's a place for osteoblasts to come in and place new bone. And so vitamin D actually facilitates having a, the, the correct amount of breakdown or maturation of bone and then the correct amount of building up of new bone. Without vitamin D, that can't happen. Now, from for, from hormonal perspective, I believe that a variety of things need to be in place. We certainly need to have a balance of hormones. That can't take place. Uh, osteoclast, osteoblast balance can't take place unless you have a balance of hormones in your body as well. But if you don't have the right amount of vitamin D3, it's not going to take place as well. So in, in retrospect, bone remodeling, bone maintenance was never about calcium. It's always been about hormonal balance and vitamin D3, being exposed to the sun, basically. What about cancer? Well, there are some mechanisms that work with vitamin D3 that causes um, cancer, and I, I hesitate to word prevention, but that could cause cancer prevention. It increases cell differentiation. It suppresses the growth uh, stimulatory signals. So, you know, um, basically cancer cells grow, multiply, and divide. Well, vitamin D3 suppresses that. It stops the amount of veins that come around tumors that feed tumors. That's angiogenesis. It reduces metastases. So it stops cancer from, from circling and, and going into other areas. Um, it modulates immune response. So there's a variety of mechanisms that vitamin D3 can use to prevent cancer. And if you are on a cancer prevention program, it needs to include vitamin D3. We talk about in terms of internal cancer because there still is lots of um, queries and concerns about skin cancer and vitamin D. Although if you go on to uh, the Vitamin Research Council or the Grassroots Organization or listen to Dr. Dougal, they're all saying that you need protection from vitamin D for even skin cancer. And that part of the problem has, has been that we haven't had that protection because we've actually feared by getting out in the sun and so our bodies aren't producing enough. But vitamin D was first suggested as a, a cancer risk, a deficiency of vitamin D suggested as a cancer risk by uh, Cedric and Frank Garland, who are quoted extensively on um, the Vitamin D Research Council uh, website. If you want more information about their research, I invite and encourage you to go have a look. Um, they, you know, now these two gentlemen are suggesting that there's a latitudinal uh, across the United States, across the world position uh, on the lack of production of vitamin D causing, um, for instance, colon cancer and increasing its mortality. And, and perhaps there is some validity to that. And I, I would, uh, you know, as we look, certainly those of us that live in the north of North America do tend to have a higher cancer, particularly colon cancer, breast cancer. Uh, and these are two studies that support that low levels of vitamin D um, could have an effect on these cancers. 
Um, arthritis is certainly uh, a, a major one, and I'm using, I, I'm just picking out a variety. I'm, this is by no means a definitive list because there are many more things that are coming to the forefront. But it's interesting to note that almost one in three North Americans who are over the age of 45 will be affected by arthritis. And the studies are showing, there's, this is a Framingham study, showed that if you have um, a vitamin D3 level below 36 nanograms per mole, then you know, it's, you're, if you do have osteoarthritis, it's going to progress more rapidly. Another study found that uh, hips, uh, osteoarthritis in the hips progressed more rapidly when we had low levels of vitamin D. So there, there is a connection. For hormonally challenged women, uh, the impact of, on inflammation and the immune response was certainly higher for those women that had low levels of vitamin D. And so I would encourage all hormonally challenged women, um, peri and postmenopausal particularly, to make sure your vitamin D stores are up to where they should be in the right level. What about cold and flu? I, I found this very interesting. Um, if you look at the middle part of this slide, the researchers um, concluded that significant influenza vaccines effectiveness could not be demonstrated for any season, any age, or any setting. I found that interesting. I've encouraged my mom not to take the flu shot for this very reason, that I believe that it was not effective. Um, a group health study found that flu shots do not protect elderly people against developing pneumonia, the primary cause of death resulting as a complication of the flu. So <laughs> that leaves the elderly, what are they to do? Well, one of the thoughts on this, and this again is uh, Dr. Garland, is they believe that influenza is a vitamin D deficiency disease. They believe that the vitamin D levels fall to their lowest point during flu season. And just think about it now. When, when are we most uh, likely to develop the flu? In the middle of summer? No. There are very flu, very flu, few flu or influenza uh, outbreaks in that time. They usually all happen when? January, February, March. And uh, so this research on the Hong Kong flu, um, I actually um, had uh, the Hong Kong flu in, in the 1968 um, part, January, February, March, January, December, January, February. Um, both of these epidemics um, developed in that over the winter time frame. So think about it, that's when vitamin D3 is lowest. And this has been shown over and over and over again. Vitamin D3 levels drop in the winter. Now, when it comes to cold and flu, what is the mechanism? Well, D3 helps regulate the T cells, which are the natural killer cells that function in, in our immune system. They make our immune system strong. Um, and so in that, they act as an immune system modulator. And this information, again, is some of the research that Dr. Garland has done, Dr. Canal has done. Um, vitamin D3 plays a major role in protecting us from infection. Now, this study was done on, on the lungs. And you know, on and on and on it goes. If you want to protect your body from the flu, these researchers are suggesting vitamin D3. What about the effect on depression and perhaps cognitive function? Well, vitamin D3 deficiency is common in older adults and it has been implicated in psychi psychiatric neurologic disorders. Now, this again is coming from the uh, Geriatric Psychiatry American Journal. Um, and they did a study with older, you know, um, 80 older adults with mild, you know, Alzheimer's, and, um, but they were not um, demented. And a D3 deficiency was associated with their mood. Now, to correct it, of course, um, you know, they were able to improve their mood and improve their cognitive function with vitamin D3. Another study was based on almost 2,000 adults. They were over 65. And um, they evaluated their cognitive function. And this study found that when, as the levels of vitamin D went down, so you know, you bring in your stores in the summer as they went down over the winter, um, cog levels of cog cognitive impairment went up as well. So recognize that if, if you have 
some cognitive dysfunction, no people that have, giving them vitamin D3 seems to be a very good option. What about sad disease? Now, we look at sad disease, we know that it's sunshine deficient. And, and so basically then that should mean that we are vitamin D3 deficient. So if, if incorporating vitamin D3 into our system would help, and of course this is in fact what has shown, and these studies are from the late 1900s. Researchers of these studies also observed that vitamin D stimulates the brain to produce more serotonin, as uh, and a neuro, that's a neuroreceptor, and um, it alleviates depression, basically. What about autoimmune diseases? Um, there's a research report that shows that vitamin D regulates the growth and differentiation of multiple cell types. Um, and it, it displays the ability to regulate the immune system and to become an anti-inflammatory in, in our body. So what's the effect of that? Well, um, in studies it's shown that uh, autoimmune diseases like arthritis, like lupus, like diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, um, prostatitis, um, MS, all of these seem to be affected in a positive way by vitamin D3. And to improve vitamin D3 stores seems to be the thing that we ought to be doing. This is interesting about lupus. I encounter many women with hormonal challenges who have lupus. Um, many of them don't make a hormone connection. It was Dr. John Lee in his book, What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Menopause, that made the connection between uh, low levels of hormones and lupus. Now the studies are showing that additionally a low level of the hormone vitamin D3 um, is also a, a possible um, relationship. MS. Now this was the, uh, a surprise for me. How many of you, like me, know someone who has MS? And how many have heard that vitamin D reduces both the risk and the symptoms? Probably, I bet, hardly anybody in the audience. Look at this. There's an estimated 330,000 Americans that have MS, and it is a chronic debilitating disease that affects the spinal cord and brain. Often it is found in women, more commonly in women. This is a little bit of a quiz, um, and I just want you to quickly with me read through these, these uh, statements. There's a genetic component to MS risk with northern Europeans being on higher risk, true or false. You are two times more likely to get MS if you live in Europe or North America than in the tropics, true or false. The prevalence rate for MS is twice as high in the US above the 37th parallel than below, true or false. Exposure to the sun at any age decreases the likelihood of developing MS, true or false. Norwegians who live along the coast have a lower risk of the MS than those who live inland, and Eskimos who eat a traditional diet of bear liver, bear liver, whale, seal grubber, oily fish, have almost no MS, true or false. Well, look at the answers to this. There is a genetic component to MS for those who live in the northern part of Europe. That is true. Two times more likely in northern Europe or northern America Actually, it's five times more likely to develop MS if you live in Northern Europe or Northern America. Uh, the prevalence rate for MS is twice as high in the, U in the U.S. above the 37th parallel. That's approximately San Diego. That's true. Exposure to the sun at any age decreases the likelihood of developing MS. False. Exposure to the sun before the age of 15 reduces MS, period. Now. For those of us who have been slathering on sunscreen on our young children and not exposing them to the sun, this is a very serious statement. Norwegians who live along the coast have a lower risk of MS than those who live inland. True. Um, they eat more fish, higher in cholesterol, <laughs> and higher than in vitamin D. Vitamin D and cholesterol come together in foods, by the way. Eskimos who eat a traditional diet have almost no MS. Correct, because they have a, a constant diet of vitamin D and cholesterol together. Strong latitudinal gradients are found in Australia, Europe, 
um, south of the 60 degree north in the U.S. and in the U.S. So you can draw a line and say north of that. Boy, it escalates. MS escalates. Childhood UV exposure, especially in winter, reduces the risk of MS in Tasmania. So they've actually done studies with children who have not had D3 exposure. Um, and those in the UK with skin cancer were found to have half the rate of multiple sclerosis of the rest of the population. Uh, so it escalated. All right, so look at the prevalence. Now, there, there are very few populations of people that you can actually study. Um, but this was a group of war veterans that they studied and where they resided. And so the, if you look at 35, between 35 and 45 latitude, that's where the most MS amongst veterans of World War II happened. And so recognize that latitudinal position of the sun is going to have um, a bearing on, on degree of sickness. So these findings, again, related to MS, seem to be related to the UVB rays. Uh, they seem to be related to the amount of vitamin D that your body produces. Um, I want you to note, though, that all of this information that came from Dr. Haney uh, is not a scientific conclusion. The medical community have not adopted this, and how sad that is. So MS prevention by vitamin D, and this is what Dr. William Grant, who's presented a paper on this, says. I estimate that 40 to 70 percent of MS in the U.S. could have been prevented through adequate vitamin D, especially in the winter. Now that's quite a statement. Um, and, and so I, I really believe, you know, serious de disease prevention, you know, circulating vitamin D levels need to be addressed. More diseases that are affected. Well, muscle pain and weakness, progression of rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes seems to be influenced by vitamin D. Uh, certainly, you know, the brain is affected. Um, any inflammatory disease like irritable bowel, Crohn's, uh, high blood pressure, heart disease. Now, I'm doing a, a talk in um, February on heart disease on the 17th. And I'll be bringing in the vitamin D effect there. I just didn't have enough time to get it all into here. But we'll talk about vitamin D and heart disease, vitamin D and high blood pressure then, tuberculosis. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's almost going to become a case of what does vitamin D not affect? And I guess we have to ask ourselves the question then, <laughs> why are we so deficient? Well, the main reasons is as Dr. Dougal presented in his talk, society has really dramatically changed from the early 1900s when they established the, um, the norms for vitamin D. At that time, most everybody worked outside or was outside, um, and certainly it was before there was um, any, any sunscreen available. And so we had a lot of skin exposure to the sun. That's almost uh, done a 180 degree reversal because now most everybody, and you think about it yourself, spends their waking moments indoors. Children, elderly, and anybody who's in a working environment. Most of us work indoors in a building. Even the farmers today are in enclosed tractors. So even farmers are not being exposed to the sun. So basically, we're out of the sun. Our skin is not producing an adequate amount of vitamin D3. If you combine that with the fear of the sun that has been perpetuated over the last decade or two um, because of skin cancer, uh, it's an amazing thing. When you think about it, uh, for those of us that believe the sun was created for our benefit, to think that we would run from sun exposure 100% is almost ludicrous. You know, vitamin D3 used to be called the sunshine vitamin. Um, and it was commonly thought that it was healthy for us. Well, vitamin D from the sun is still the main source uh, of vitamin D for us. And it's actually the source that stores in our body most regularly. Now, certainly we can get it from fish, um, and foods that are high in cholesterol, like and animal foods primarily, or from supplementation. But sun still is the best source. I attended a conference where Dr. David Brownstein uh, asked us if we were um, exposed to sunscreens. How many of you were not? 
as young people. And of course, not a number of us who were over 60 put up our hands and we said that we, in our youth, we have not been exposed to sunscreens. He said, well, how did you protect yourself from sun damage? And because the majority of us, well, all of us in the room, not, uh, of us, we had not been um, saddled with any type of skin cancer. And he said, well, you know, how did you protect yourself from the sun? And uh, somebody put up their hand and said, you know, when our skin began to get pink, we were told to come in and put a shirt on. He said, what a thought, rather than using sunscreens, put a shirt on once your skin has become slightly pink. So we today are recognizing that solar UVB radiation is the most important source for humans on Earth. We need it. Our body derives a very important uh, hormone from it, and that is um, D3. Certainly dietary sources are going to be important. Uh, we know already that people that eat fish, that again is high in cholesterol, that live in you know the, the countries that uh, are close to water, they seem to have more dietary, more vitamin D in their system. But certainly there are foods that are fortified, just be careful that they're not fortified with vitamin D2. Although the industry is becoming more cognizant of the fact that there is a difference between D2 and D3. Supplements only of D3, if you can't see D3 on the supplement that you're taking, don't take it. Um, because it could be a supplement of D2, with, which is not going to provide you with the same protection. And here comes the real kicker, UVB uh, lamps that mimic the solar uh, rays reaching the Earth's surface. So we're coming back to tanning booths again that have UV, UVB radiation. So uh, mild tanning for those who live in the north is going to be an accepted way of producing vitamin D on our skin. <clears throat> so let's talk about sun exposure. Scientists estimate that as much as 25,000 IUs of vitamin D can be produced with full body exposure to the sun within an hour. Now, I don't know how many of you tan naked, but you see full body exposure is the key word there. Um, and we want to do this tanning before our skin turns pink. <clears throat> so tanning bed exposure is likely going to be about five minutes in a tanning bed um, in the winter months. Uh, exposing our skin uh, with full body exposure to get the equivalent and probably have to do it three or four times a week. With a 30 minute exposure, um, lightly pigmented uh, people are going to produce about 50,000 IUs of vitamin D. So it depends on the pigmentation of your skin. Um, you know, Dr. David is darkly pigmented. I'm mediumly pigmented. I have children that are uh, even more medium than me, and then we have children that are very lightly uh, pigmented. Um, so we have to be careful how we expose our skin. Certainly the dark pigmentations can handle longer durations in the sun, um, and they in fact need a longer duration in the sun to produce an adequate amount of vitamin D. Tanning is our, our body's way of protecting us from overexposure and overproduction of vitamin D. So then where does sunscreen come in? Well, sunscreen, even with an SPF low of 8, decreases vitamin D production by 95%. So what we don't want to be doing is applying SPF to our skin every time we go out in the sun. We want to spend a little bit of time allowing sun exposure because that's the best form of vitamin D3. I had a, a young woman call me or email me the other day and she said, I can't take vitamin D supplements. For some reason, they bother me terribly, and I react to them. What can I do? And I said, well, <laughs> expose yourself to the sun. What a thought. <laughs> and, and also, expose yourself to the sun, to the UVB rays in a tanning booth, very lightly and gently tanning, um, not inappropriate, so that your body is going to become replete with vitamin D3. You know, there are really no known cases of vitamin D toxicity with extreme ex or prolonged exposure to the sun. Your skin just gets darker and darker and protects your body. So, you know, they've evaluated people that work outside on an ongoing basis. And really and truly, because most of their skin when they work outdoors is not exposed, they're getting about 5,000 IUs of supplementation a day. 
by being out in the sun. So it, it's, it's really not health challenging as long as you don't burn your skin. Put on a shirt. The controversy avoiding sunlight and blocking uh, UVB with sunscreen, uh, it, it, it's just not desirable. According to um, Sam Schuster, who's um, in the Department of Dermatology at Newcastle University, he says the big mistake was that the idea that sun exposure causes melanoma, and they went public with it before it was proven. In fact, he says we don't know what causes melanoma. There you go. So be aware that we, everybody needs some vitamin D to combat skin cancer, to combat other cancers in our body. Well, here we have the map of the United States and lower Canada. Recognize the further north you go, it just gets worse. But the 37th latitude, if you look <laughs> where it is, my goodness, it goes right through um, Virginia and Texas and, uh, you know, it comes right over to California. And anywhere north of that parallel it seems to be that we become more and more deficient. And for people who live in cities where there's lots of pollution, even going out in the sun, exposing your skin, is not going to provide you with enough D3 because of the pollution in the air. If you look at the, the line that uh, is purple, that is where the most sun is obtained, the dark, rich purple that goes throughout the center of the United States, or even the brown, dark brown, uh, right across the United States. Above that, um, we get very little exposure and it certainly is sporadic. So the green and the light blue and the dark blue are problematic for production of vitamin D. So sources of vitamin D uh, outside of the sun would include fish, would include cheese, would include uh, milk, and recognize that these are all high in cholesterol, or it could include supplements. Um, and it was brought to the forefront. Now, I read an article on mushrooms. <clears throat> you really don't get very much from mushrooms. You get, you get more from salmon, cod liver oil, and fortified foods than you do from mushrooms. Um, but even eggs provide a little bit of vitamin D. Remember that most of those foods, 80% of those foods on this list, are also high in cholesterol. Cholesterol is needed for the manufacture of vitamin D. So who's at risk for insufficient vitamin D stores? Well, anybody who limits their sun exposure, homebound individuals, uh, people living in the, those northern latitudes, anybody who wears robes and head coverings for religious reasons, anybody or for any reason, any, anybody who works in occupations that prevent sun exposure. Uh, populations, huge populations are at risk. Anybody with a darker pigmentation to their skin. Elderly are going to be at risk. Infants are going to be at risk. Obesity is a risk factor. Um, anybody with limited sunlight exposure, those that are living in Alaska, for instance, or in the Yukon. Let's talk about the dark pigmentation of the skin. High melanin is what causes the pigmentation, and it reduces the ability for the skin to produce vitamin D. Now, in people that are tanning, that ability is necessary because then your vitamin D stores, as they become replete, you're going to become uh, darker and darker skin so that your body's not producing as much. So it's a safety valve as well. But those who have existing dark pigmentation are going to have a higher risk for a deficiency. Elderly, certainly because vitamin D plays such a huge role in bone and bone density, if they would have a couple of things going against them, they're not outside a lot, they probably do not have a high cholesterol level or an adequate cholesterol level so that their skin, even if they were outside, wouldn't be able to produce enough vitamin D. So they're going to be at higher risk for bone density issues aside from some of the other things. I think that um, dementia and certainly depression in elderly could also uh, have a connection here. Obesity, because vitamin D is stored in our body's fat cells, um, it isn't always available for use in people that have obesity issues. And so even if adequate vitamin D is produced by the sun, it may not be physiologically available. Now, you know, there isn't data on recommended amounts 
to increase based on body weight. And I believe that more and more studies are being done on this issue. But if you are a person on this call who is considered obese, make sure that you um, supplement your vitamin D stores and get out in the sun. That's the best way for producing um, vitamin D3 in our body. So how much do we really need? Um, a deficiency is considered at 10 nanograms per mole, 25 for the Canadian chart uh, or the uh, European chart. Insufficiency is between 10 and 30. 40 to 80 is where we really want to be. But for those who have osteoporosis or have been diagnosed with osteopenia, for bone health reasons and perhaps if you've been diagnosed with a serious disease, you're going to need upwards of 90 to 100. Now I have a, a lovely chart that shows this. And if you'll notice, on the left is the U.S. standard, on the right is the European or Canadian standard. And so when doctors are targeting this, we look to target between 60 and 80 as, as the beginnings of optimal, but some people will need to get towards 100 or in the Canadian or European chart, 250 uh, nanograms per mole. Uh, we actually have a really good newsletter on D3 and D3 testing. Uh, that is available from Helpful Hormones. You can go on the website and uh, click on D3 testing. You can find test kits there, but you'll also find our newsletter that has that lovely chart in it. So again, how much do we need? Well, a maintenance for most people, we want to maintain above 40 nanograms per mole for sure. And, you know, we've done about 300 tests now of D3. Um, with a very sophisticated test, um, a little bit more so than what's normally out there. And we make that test available to people. And we're, we're seeing that the majority of people are not, uh, do not have D3 sufficient levels. Um, if you work outdoors, you may not need a supplement. Um, but most people are going to likely have to consider supplementing supplementing um, because we're just not exposing enough of our skin to the sun even when we're out there. So typically anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 IUs a day is what we ought to be supplementing. Well, uh, this is the position that the lab that we work with takes, 500 IU per day supplement for two to three months and then obtain a test. Your stores will become replete somewhere between you know, two and three, four months of supplementation, and then you should be able to test. Now, if you want to test before you start, I advise that as well, um, because you'll, you know, some of you just on this call are not going to believe that you need some vitamin D. Adjust your dosage so that your blood levels are between 40 and 80 nanograms per mole, 125 to 200 for Canadians. Um, we recommend adequate vitamin D for two months test, check your levels. And that's a pretty consistent way to look at it. What about toxic intake of vitamin D? Well, supplementally, there, <clears throat> excuse me, there doesn't seem to be any toxicity up to 10,000 units. And really, there doesn't seem to be any toxicity after that either. But, you know, more isn't always better. More isn't necessary. Why spend your money on more? So our advice is still, you know, be realistic about a therapeutic intake. Test first. Find out what you can do to bring up your levels to where they should be. <clears throat> and as Dr. Dougal said, uh, if your stores are low, uh, 10,000 IUs per day for three or four months, then drop it down to a 2,000 um, IU per day uh, remediated dose seems to be what works for the majority of people. <clears throat> um, to, to become toxic with vitamin D is all, almost unheard of. It's very, very rare. Um, there are just only one group of people. There's an important note at the bottom. But basically, most of you can be comfortable with doses of 5,000 to 10,000 IUs per day uh, for up to five months and test. If your stores are up there, then, um, you know, Take a maintenance dose of about 2,000 IUs until the sun comes out. Dr. John Canal, president of the Vitamin D Council, suggests that nearly all cases of toxicity from pharmacological doses of vitamin D, in other words, from a prescription, <laughs> came from vitamin D2. 
And so it is prescriptions by physicians that, that seem to um, be the hardest for the body to metabolize and assimilate. So D3 is the better choice, better than D2. So what if I am deficient? Or uh, what if, you know, how can I tell if I've been overexposed to vitamin D? Well, we believe in testing. Uh, we have access to a very sophisticated test. A little bit. Th this is probably the most sophisticated test on the market. Very similar to what uh, a physician would offer um, in his um, in his off from his office. Uh, this is an excellent test. I have done about 300 of these. It comes with with very good instructions. Um, and in terms of you know getting results, we believe that you're going to be better off if you test first and then um, go into a supplemental program. And doctors like Jeffrey Dack also um, support that. The instruction booklet is very easy and clear. It's not a difficult test to do. It's very quick and simple. And we like the fact that you don't have to go to a doctor's office to do it, but you can take your results, which are uh, very excellent, to your physician, and it will give you, you can see the result, gives it to you in nan nanograms per mole. You can equate with the little colorful chart that we have in our newsletter whether or not you're sufficient or not and start on a program. We believe in testing first and not guessing. And I think that's the, the biggest take home message here tonight is if you're unsure, test. After you've been taking a D3 supplement for a period of two to three months, then you should test. And these are the ranges that you want to look at. Um, you, you want to see your ranges come slowly up. Uh, at the end of six months of supplementation, you want to be over 70, probably in close to the 80 to 100 range. And then you're going to modulate that with just uh, a remediated dose of two, uh, 2,000 IUs. The one thing about working with health for hormones, um, I've shared this with Dr. David on a number of occasions, but Everyone who purchases any form of test kit from HelpfulHormones.com has access to a consultant to review their report um, and to explain what the findings are saying and to assist with what the next step might be. So everyone who contacts us uh, and orders a kit has this opportunity and there's no additional charge for a consultation with us. Uh, even after a thorough presentation like this, <laughs> I'm going to have some people I know we say, well, do I really have to supplement? And my comment to that is if you're like an Inuit or a traditional Alaskan and eat what they eat, you'd have to consume salmon, seal, and whale at every meal. So my question to you is how does that sound and is that your plan for the future? If it's not, yes. The answer is yes. You're going to have to supplement. We produced a supplement that is a spray. Um, it has 500 IUs per spray, so you can control the spray uh, throughout the day. And four sprays equals a 2,000 IU um, dose. Um, at 2,000 IUs, that tube would last for three months. Uh, it's inexpensive. It's under $20 for three months of vitamin D3 in a nice, easy way to take it. Uh, I had a gal say to me the other day, you know, this is the best way to take vitamin D. I carry it in my purse with me and I never forget to take it. Every time I open my purse, I see it's there and I remember. And so the idea behind supplementation, of course, is compliance. <laughs> you want to remember to do this in order to have the best effect from the nutrients that you're taking. Uh, we think that a fine mist spray delivery system is the best. Again, you know, reverting back to hormones are best delivered immediately into the bloodstream. And so doing this with vitamin D, we think, is, aside from topical sun application, this is going to be a very excellent way to, um, to increase your vitamin D3. There's lots of benefits. All right, it gets D3 quickly into your system without um, going through the digestive tract. Um, the digestive tract will always pull out a, a larger percentage, often it's as much as 90% of whatever uh, supplement you're taking. So to eliminate going through the digestive tract is really a good thing. For those who don't like one more pill, this is very convenient. Um, and it has a little bit of a minty flavor and 
and some of us use it even as a breath spray. So it's, it's a really nice uh, way to do this. There are cofactors that are necessary, and uh, some of them we put in this spray. Uh, we also suggest that um, our clients consider taking uh, VeggieMax or our Daily Max supplement, both of which have the cofactors that we mentioned in, uh, at the beginning of this presentation. Our supplements are available by contacting uh, www.maxalive.com or contacting a consultant from Health for Hormones that will help you to access the supplements as well. Because vitamin D is so cheap and so clearly reduces all-cause mortality, I can say with great certainty that vitamin D represents the single most cost-effective medical intervention in the United States. So says Dr. Polatov, uh, and he's from the Northwestern Hospital in Minnesota. And I think um, we're going to find more and more physicians are going to be coming on board. He's a medical director making a very dramatic statement. And if you listen to Dr. Dougal's presentation, he made very dramatic statements about vitamin D and vitamin D3 um, consumption. I think Dr. Robert Haney's um, summary is important to note. And his comments are this, vitamin D3 deficiency, worldwide problem. It involves all ages and all races. Uh, rickets, he believes, is on the rise. Prevention and treatment are inexpensive, and they're easily implemented. Uh, serum vitamin D uh, needs to be above 40, and it's easily determined with testing. He believes in testing, not guessing, as well. He's put together a policy statement that I thought would be now, this policy statement has not been implemented anywhere that I'm aware of, but I think he did a great job on this, and he is to be commended. If I ever meet him, I'm going to heartily congratulate this gentleman for the work that he's doing. And um, for doctors like him, they, they are just really to be congratulated. So this is what he says in his policy statement. He wants us to recognize that relatively high levels of vitamin D are required for optimum health, certainly higher than what health um, the FDA have determined previously. Uh, recognize that solar ultraviolet radiation is the primary source, the sun is the primary source of vitamin D for most people on the earth. We need to recognize that dietary sources of vitamin D are generally inadequate unless one consumes large amounts of fatty seafood, uh, as do the Inuit and, <laughs> uh, and the Eskimos. So most of us are not going to be able to get it strictly with our diet. Thus, solar UVB radiation exposure should be encouraged with these considerations. Develop a tan gradually during the sunny season. Start actually in the early spring. Don't sunbathe to the point of reddening. Try to obtain UVB radiation near midday daily because that's when the UVB um, is the highest ratio to UVA. And the exposure time is less than, you know, 5-10 minutes a day is all that's necessary if you're doing it every day. Solar UVB radiation exposure. Uh, should be, you know, if you're planning a trip to a sunny vacation spot, consider indoor tanning for preparation of your skin. Um, my husband and I have been doing this for years so that we don't burn. It is burned skin that uh, develops cancer more readily. If one has skin that does not tan easily, it's freckled, be very careful in the sun. Just very gently do this. If one has skin that is dark for the latitude, then one should spend more time in the sun or take vitamin D supplements or do both. Don't tan excessively. Actually, uh, you can tell people who tan a lot often um, they're not moisturizing their skin and they have lots of wrinkles. But we do need to do some, um, just not tons. In winter, non-solar sources of vitamin D should be used. So vitamin D supplements, fish uh, should be consumed or foods that are fortified with vitamin D. And his last point is to use sun lamps. In other words, you know, he's not opposed to tanning in tanning beds. I'm sure I'm going to have some comments on that <laughs> after this call tonight. Our summary is, but we think vitamin D is absolutely essential. Um, and we think that the first place that you and I should get our vitamin D3 is from the sun. Don't fear the sun. Uh, make sure that your levels come up uh, to, you know, somewhere between 40 and 90, 80 to 100 is good as well. And in the absence of UVB uh, sun, then supplements, food choices, and uh, sun lamps are certainly um, appropriate. 
And so I hope that you're asking yourself, now, what's the next step for me? Well, use vitamin D3 as a supplement because now we're in our winter months when most of us are not outside getting sun. Even in Texas, most people are not sunbathing. Um, so in Florida, most people are not sunbathing. You're not going to find everybody at the beach right now uh, because we are in our winter months. So using a supplement is appropriate. After three months, test. Um, and adjust your dose appropriately. Supplementation, you know, most of us will have to continue to supplement all the time if we live in the north. And by all means, test, don't guess. I, I really personally believe that vitamin D is de as a deficiency is a choice. You and I can choose better food, we can choose to be out in the sun, and we can choose to supplement. All of these are within both our financial capability and our physical capability. So vitamin D insufficiency then really is a choice as well. You can purchase D3 test kits. They're available from us. If you go to helpfulhormones.com, have a look around. The supplements are available from a different website at Max Alive, and we invite you to consider both. Go and have a look at the D3 spray. There's a product profile sheet up on the Max Alive website to, for you to have a look at. Um, we are always looking for consultants. Those would be men and women who are advocates for balanced health. Um, and we provide our own training. If you like what you hear, come and join us. We're looking for men and women who are committed to the health of others and to helping others, um, for sure. I have a significant list of references. I'm not going to go through, but I have three pages of references. And I want to end with this. I, I hope that I've brought to your attention the need to consider D3 testing and D3 supplementation and being out in the sun in a greater way. If I have done this, then this presentation is a success. Please let your journey for more information on vitamin D3 not stop here. Um, this should just be the beginning, but continue to pursue information about this exciting new area of hormone health with a vengeance. This could mean your own health, and you're doing it for your health sake. All right, David, I am uh, finished. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow, wow. How comprehensive can you get? Oh, thank you, Jackie. This, 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 this covers really all the bases. And it makes it so clear and straightforward. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. I know there are a couple of questions. Um, so folks, go ahead. Uh, if you have any questions or things you're not clear about, just type in the chat box. To, to your top right, top right of your screen. Now I want to take it back for a few minutes just to show a couple of things while Jackie is looking at the questions. And Jackie, the questions are just above the chat. And I'll read them out, but just so you can start preparing for them as you're going along. So um, further down, just above the chat, the chat box. Okay. And folks, the you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, folks, th this the re replay of this presentation will be available. Again, we're making it uh, half price, so uh, we'll send you a link for that, so don't, don't worry about it. Um, also, uh, Jackie has done quite a few webinars for us, and, and uh, we've at the beginning I mentioned that we put together a hormone series. Uh, this is the, 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 our homepage, the homepage of our, of our website. And all you need to do is uh, go to where her banner is and then click on uh, click here for healthy hormones, and that takes you to the next page, which is really a page devoted to Jackie Harvey's. There you see her picture over there, and here's a list of her, all the webinars really that she has done, from iodine health to breast cancer, uh, hormone balance and breast cancer, to women's hormonal balance, to men's hormonal balance. Uh, Dr. Mead, I believe, is uh, he, he's doing the whole, um, vitamin D testing as well, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so Dr. Media does all Jackie's hormonal test, hormone testing, and he is a very uh, has has a high reputation. I think one of the biggest labs in the country uh, for testing uh, hormones, and he does a great job. And of course, she mentioned uh, Dr. Owens. Jackie, have anything? Do you have anything to add about this series? 
Well, I think that it's, you know, when it, when it comes to hormones, it's not going to be just one thing. I know a lot of women think it's just about estrogen. But we talk about estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. We talk about uh, iodine levels as it relates to the thyroid. All these, uh, and vitamin D now plays a role because they all have an effect on the endocrine system. And so it's, it's not just about one thing. And so when we're educating, we want everyone to understand um, that it's not difficult, but I, every woman can understand it. Every man can understand it. And this is understandable presentation. With lots of slides, lots and lots of slides. And we are making, this is all, this is worth 70 bucks, and we are making it $25 for everyone, especially those of you who are joining the webinar. Now, um, I had a question really about, golly, what's happening? I probably need some more estrogen to help me remember things in my brain. <laughs> but okay, I'll tell you what. I'm not sure that's your hormone of choice. <laughs> <laughs> but it does help with the brain, right? I mean, isn't it? Isn't that <laughs> okay. Brain uh, function and testosterone. Haven't you heard that before? That well, that true. That that is true too. Yeah, that too. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's gonna come back to me, but in the meantime, I'm gonna add this back to you, Jackie. Oh, well, hang on. I think I can read the questions out here. Yeah, go ahead. Read them out to me. That's better. Okay, we're going to do that. All right. Uh, okay, yeah. The, what, what I was trying to remember, a couple of people have asked for the handouts. You might want to rethink the handout thing, but I'm no pressure. We can talk about it later, and then whatever you decide upon, we'll, uh, we'll go with. Okay. Well, I, I, from my perspective, the handouts versus ordering the webinar, I think that everyone's going to get a lot more out of the webinar than just a bunch of words. You get all the pictures and the diagrams, and so I think the more valuable piece is to review the webinar. Right. Okay. Well said. Well said. Okay. Uh, so, folks, we are you get the webinar. Get the webinar. All right. <laughs> I have read testing is better, quote unquote, via LabCorp as opposed to Quest. Does Labrix use LabCorp? Yes. Ah, okay. Bingo. And, and, and the, the concern is correct, all right? The concern, it, it, which lab you're using is important. It really is important. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Okay, someone says, or Phyllis says, thank you, Jackie. Do you need to take a calcium su supplement along with vitamin D3, or would you get sufficient calcium from a normal diet with milk? and cereal ETC from Phyllis in Queensland, Australia. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, here's the perspective, and I share this with Dr. Dougal. I liked what he said as well, but I've been teaching what Dr. John R. Lee has said for the last 15 years, and his comment was, most of us do not need to supplement with anything more than 250 to maybe 300 milligrams of calcium that most of us are able to obtain if we're eating a proper diet with green leafy vegetables and nuts and seeds and, and a little bit of berry, we should be able to get about 1,000 milligrams of calcium through our diet. Dr. Dougal made a very dramatic statement in his presentation, and he said we do not and should not be taking more than 25, uh, 250 milligrams of calcium at any time. And you know, there's a study that was shown, the Women's Health Initiative study of 2002 did an ongoing or an adjunct study that showed that women that, that supplemented more than 1,500, or say, you know, who did supplement 1,500 milligrams of calcium over and above their diet were at higher risk for kidney stones and bone spurts. Really? Dr. Dougal, yes. And Dr. Dougal's comment was, you know, they, they focus in on the wrong thing because D3 is what will bring any calcium that's in your diet into your bones. So why supplement with calcium when it's a D3 deficiency that we've been experiencing? And to me, that makes perfect sense. That's revolutionary because, I mean, he, he, everywhere, most people are talking about Calcium being the number one nutrient deficiency, and everybody's saying take your calcium supplements and take your calcium supplements. But if that was true, David, then why have we not turned around osteoporosis in the last 50 years when we've been saying that? That's a good point. Well, so, so, so let's talk about bone, uh, bone health. 
for just a moment here because bone health to me encompasses, number one, you must have balanced hormones. So you must have an adequate amount of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, which are the three main hormones that support osteoclast and osteoblast activity or bone remodeling in the body. Number two, you must exercise because it is, it is weight-bearing exercise that is going to improve bone density. So if you have osteopenia or have been diagnosed with osteoporosis, then you need weight-bearing exercise. Walking is only going to um, maintain existing bone. It won't add new bone. It has to be weight-bearing. And then lastly, you want to talk about your diet. If you're not getting 1,000 milligrams of calcium in your diet daily, then supplement by all means. But on the average, like in our supplement pack, we have a product called Daily Max for hormonally challenged women. It helps to modulate estrogen, does a whole bunch of things. Now, we only put 250 milligrams of calcium in that pack. And Dr. Lee advised us back 15 years ago, women are over-consuming calcium. That's not the issue. The issue is vitamin D3. It's absorption of calcium. That has always been the issue. Long answer for a short question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you made a good point. You're, you're, almost, you're almost as dogmatic as Dr. Dougal himself, huh? <laughs> well, I have some advantages that I'm not a physician. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I, I sit at the feet of those who, and admire those who are very good at what they do. And, and I have appreciated many of the speakers that you've brought on. You know, I think uh, Dr. Barry Sears, for instance, is, is another person that everybody on this call should listen to. He, he is, his perspective on diet and nutrition is excellent. And recognize he's talking about forms of fat. And when we're talking about vitamin D uh, absorption, Interesting. Think of how many elderly people do not have enough cholesterol in their body to um, absorb vitamin D or to produce vitamin D. Uh, and that concerns me greatly because so many uh, men and women from the age of 50, 60, 70, 80 are put on uh, cholesterol-lowering medication. Right. How is their skin, if they go out in the sun, going to be, um, you know, I think the whole cholesterol issue needs to be addressed as well. Absolutely, and and you did mention um, Dr. Barry Sears, and he has um, what a what a man, what a wealth of information. He will be on actually a week from today, right here. There, there he is. He's going to be speaking on insulin resistance, and he obviously um, cholesterol is a major part of what he talks about, and he's probably going to be tying that in as well. So, uh, very very important stuff. And well, and I would just add that vitamin D three then has a connection with insulin resistance. So people that are insulin resistant, people that are developing obesity, uh, they're going to have a problem with, I, I bet if they, anybody who on this call who is a diabetic or has been uh, pre-diabetic, diagnosed pre-diabetic or with um, syndrome X or insulin resistance should do a D3 test and I'll just bet they are low and deficient in vitamin D. It seems like vitamin D is almost like a common denominator in practically everything, isn't it? Well, you know what? The amazing thing to me is that God put the sun in the sky, <laughs> <laughs> and we would hide from it. How ridiculous is that? He put it there for a reason. Right, and, and you know what? We African American, well, we people of African descent have a, 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 a shockingly low in vitamin D three, unfortunately. Well, absolutely, and you know, again, I bet it, you don't find that necessarily with people that are over in Africa that are exposing their skin regularly, um, you know, their skin is actually protecting them from overexposure, but they're getting enough. It's, it's when we come here and, you know, I mean, we want you to put clothes on, David, but the idea here is, you know, that we still have to expose our skin. Right, right. I didn't even know what suntan lotion was until I came here. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, folks, I'm Jackie will be speaking about um, heart health and hormones on the 17th. So you want to be going to mark your calendars for that. So that's going to be uh, three weeks from today. Okay. Um, okay. Here's another question. Do fish oil supplements help? Absolutely. Uh, you, the only thing I would caution people with fish oil, you know, it's better to eat the fish, first of all. Get, get the the food as close to food as you can to start. Secondly, you know, I live on the West Coast, 
and we have an abundance of salmon here when there is an abundance of salmon. Um, to note that farm-raised fish has less essential fats in it than, than fish that's out in the wild. So you, you'd need more fish for the essential fats. Be careful of the mercury. So there, you want to, if you're going to take an oil product, just make sure that it's manufactured well, that they try to extrude the mercury from it, um, and, and or extract it, if you would, and, and make sure that you're taking a good quality product. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a cheap oil product if it were me. All right. Now, my company, we don't make an oil product, and I, I use other things, but. If you're going to take an oil, make sure it's a good quality. Right. That's a good point, especially with the fish that um, people are dealing with today. Uh, you, you, it, you almost have to go out of your way to look for fish that does not have the mercury and the other toxins in it. Correct. So, but when you're eating whole fish, it's not concentrated. When they make the oils, when they prepare the oils, they're concentrating it. So it's even, you know, you need to even be more careful. I I started taking um, coconut oil, for instance. I see. And I I think that that's a really good um, way of getting essential fats. I use uh, hemp seed oil, very good as well. Mm -hmm. And for those of you looking for who who want to take fish oils, um, Dr. Barry Sears has among the best fish oils out there in the market. So. That would be a good place to go. That would be the zone. Yeah, he's on top of it and trying to pick out what's best. Yeah, and he he tells you how to how to how to test for the right. There's a, there's a what he calls a toothpick test, and uh, that will help you to uh, tell the good fish oil supplements from the bad ones. Oh, very good. Yeah, he's a really smart guy. That that man. Okay, well, I think that covers it for the questions. Very good. That means I did a good job. Pure questions tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 let's just put it this way. You didn't talk about disease specifically. People tend to uh, have a lot of questions when you tie in a specific condition and ailments. But you were talking about health for the most part today. So, um, you know what I'm saying? Yes, and the, and the topic vitamin D3 for health is, is where it's at. That really is truthfully where it's at. Right, exactly. Because I know from your your breast cancer and hormone balance, there were lots of questions for that. Well, and I think you have to recognize for women the hormonal uh, topics really hit closer to home. And I, you know, it, it's probably appropriate to bring it up that I I will be talking about the hormonal um, uh, position for both men and women in the month of March, um, and. And even there, I don't mention specifics, but women automatically connect hormone imbalance with breast cancer, hormonal imbalance with ovarian cancer, hormone imbalance with uterine cancer. It's just automatic. Men connect it with prostate cancer. We, it's just an automatic connection that we make. Right, right. But you know, I don't. I, I. We're not talking about remediating specific disease. We're talking about a prevention program or a way of evaluating to see if you have a deficiency that could potentially cause a disease. Um, and that's a whole different ballgame. I love prevention. Me too. But I like build, building strength even better than prevention. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Peter, Peter threw in a question. This will be the last one for tonight. Does the brand of D3 matter? I think it does. You know, um, I, I'm moving away from pills that have to go through the digestive tract. And I know, I mean, D3 is very, very cheap. And so, you know, we put it into three of our own products. Uh, but one of them is a liquid, and the other one is the spray. And I think in the end, the spray is going to win out as far as absorption is concerned. So. I think that having anything more go through the digestive tract, much of it's going to be shunted out as it's metabolized in the system. It's not going to hit the liver. And so even though it's inexpensive, what we don't want to do is cause the liver to have to process more than it needs to process. So I'm, I'm kind of moving away from pills for D3, if we could, and that's why we decided we elected to, to produce a spray. I see. I see. 
People are tired of pills anyways. <laughs> That's True. just a fact. True. And we want to, and you know, compliance is everything. Remembering to do it is everything. And you know, I don't know if there's anybody on these calls who wants to take a handful of pills. And most of the D3 pills come in 1,000 IU things. So you're taking, you know, five to 10 a day. I don't think that that's the route that we ought to be considering. So I like a liquid or I like a spray. I think both of those are going to be fast, easy way to do it. The spray is even good because you can do it throughout the day. And I, I believe in dispensing our food throughout the day, so our supplements should be throughout the day. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. All right. Well said. Well done. Excellent presentation, as always. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you for all your support for Building Strength. Uh, we, 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 we've enjoyed our collaboration, and hopefully we'll continue to get even more and more as, we, as the year goes on. All righty. Well, uh, wrapping up tonight, uh, have a good night, everyone, and we shall see you probably next week. Good night. God bless. Good night.